Welcome to week 13 of HI3284. Here we are at the end of the subject and it's time to pull it together and forge some sort of conclusion. This was a big subject and I really hope that you got a lot out of it and that you've got things that will keep you thinking, that you'll keep considering the things we've dealt with in the subject. I'm going to try and pull what I consider to be the big ideas together and we'll look back at some of the slides we've seen already in the subject. So in this lecture, I think we need to consider again why we write history, who gets to write history, how we write history, both in terms of the evidence that we use and in terms of the outputs that we create. And it's worth thinking too about why historians, while thoroughly charming, are also a thoroughly disagreeable bunch in that we keep disputing other people's ideas and we keep arguing about quite how we should interpret the past. Well, that's a lot to take on, but in this subject, we have taken on a lot. I'm not sure that I'm going to address all of these questions directly, but I hope that you'll continue to consider them. Buried in the subject outline, among all those pages that aren't really worth consulting in detail, other subject learning outcomes for this subject. And while I don't consider those pages worth dealing with, I think these learning outcomes are worth looking at. I think we've met them. We've spent time discussing skills and finding sources, where they're going to be, what might exist, how they can be used. And there in that second dot point is that how are we going to use these things? What are we actually trying to do? How do we write history? We've discussed a lot of history in this subject. We've discussed the nuts and bolts of history writing. And by now, you'll have done some. Oral history appears in this list because it's really important. But because of ethical concerns, we've considered it rather than done it. I think you've got enough from the subject that if you do do oral history research in the future, you'll do it well. And that fourth point is also a little bit problematic. You've learned about different ways of writing, and I know that it's a challenge to write for Arcadia NQ, but I haven't given you the option of picking up a chisel, finding a slab of marble, and making a monument. There are many ways in which history is communicated and at least you're aware of them. And in your future careers, you may participate in some of them. So I think these were worthwhile subject learning outcomes, and I think we've met them in interesting ways. Right back at the start of the subject, I gave you a pep talk. A pep talk about how the subject will be useful to you, even if you don't turn out to be a career historian. It'll be useful to you in making dinnertime conversation. History is fascinating stuff. But the skills you've learned here are going to be useful in your day jobs as well. History is great for teaching writing. It's not enough to find out about the past. It's necessary to communicate about the past and to communicate clearly in addition, all that suspicion that you've brought to your sources and the care with which you've read them and dissected them makes you good when dealing with text. When you're churning it out yourself, when you're taking apart other people's, when you're thinking critically. I hope you've enjoyed the subject and I don't want you to discount the skills that we've been working on throughout it. Because this is the history capstone subject, we have discussed history, not just how to use history's transferable skills. And we've discussed the difficulties of understanding what actually occurred in the past. That distinction between history and the past is something that I hope you'll carry with you as you leave the subject. And perhaps I'm making a rod for my own back because I'm hoping that as you leave this subject, while you might respect historians, you're not automatically going to trust them or their interpretations of the past. Understanding the past in terms that the present can cope with is an ongoing, impossible task. 
but one that's exciting, largely enjoyable, and thoroughly valuable for people in the present. History is something that's created in the present, and it does reflect not just the person writing it, but the society producing it. What questions we ask about the past depend on where we stand in the present. In this subject, I introduced the term historiography. And while it's something you may choose to never write, I hope it's something that you'll engage with. The idea that looking at the histories that people write and how they write them tell us not just about the past they're writing about, but also the past they're writing in. So I've thrown these big ideas about history and history writing at you, and I think we've grappled with them successfully in tutorial. One of those ideas about how history is written that I've kept on throwing at you is the idea that in many ways it's a national project. In terms of where you might go looking for evidence about the past, I've directed you to national memory institutions and the idea that there is a national interest in preserving the past and understanding it, or at least creating a shared past that explains the present nation. You're welcome to avoid dealing with ideas about nationalism, the production of history, how we select our topics and place limits on them, whether those are national limits or other limits, but it's useful to consider how much money the nation invests in preserving certain types of evidence and in taking advantage of that when looking for evidence to explore ideas. The nation isn't the only entity that preserves a memory of itself. Before Federation, there was no Australia. There were the separate colonies and the separate colonies preserved memories of what they'd done as societies and what their governments had enacted. This series of maps is fascinating in showing the way that New South Wales has shrunk and directing those of us who are interested in history that is no longer in New South Wales, directing us towards memory institutions within New South Wales because at points in the past, the regions we're interested in were part of that entity. States have a strange life of their own. And as historians, we've got to be alert to those different levels of institution that we can go and research within. I've put up the slides about the national level. I've put up the slide about the state level, but there's also local levels. And then there are different organizations that also try to hold on to some type of memory and that have records that can be useful to historians. There are all sorts of archives out there, archives, museums, strange collections of documents. As historians, we've got to be aware that such things might exist. And as historians, we need to be alert to other types of records, not just paper ones, that might help us address questions that we want answered. In the subject, I was delighted that you all went and made some kind of a cemetery tour and that on those tours you developed some interesting ideas. Cemeteries are interesting. They're a text that can be read by historians and they're also a representation of the past. They can be read as both primary and secondary texts. And that's something that's true as well of monuments. We spent some time with the history wars and with the idea of heritage and representations of a shared past as something that's useful to the present. I hope you found that discussion of how history gets represented, what popular history is useful, and that it has made you look around you with newly opened eyes. And while cemeteries and monuments might not always be obvious 
sites for storing the past. Museums are. But they're interesting, again, in what they tell us about engagement with the past. The image of Animal Attic in the Otago Museum is part of that conversation. So it's a museum holding a museum as a relic. Museums hold interesting things. There can be useful sources within them. And museums also tell us about how people are interpreting the past and what parts of the past they think are important. In this subject, we've gone looking for records of the past in a variety of places and in a variety of forms. So I've mentioned cemeteries, monuments, and museums as possible forms of evidence about the past. We spent some time as well with images. Images need to be treated with care. They're not direct portals in the past, neither still images nor moving images, neither drawn and painted images nor photographic images. They're all objects created by people and they all need to be treated with caution. But they're also fascinating. In the subject, we looked at images and at how they might not be entirely truthful. We also picked up on how they could reveal information about the past and how they can be interpreted differently. That process of captioning images, I hope really opened your eyes to the way that images don't speak for themselves. They speak to each of us, but what they say to each of us can be quite different. Captions help readers interpret images. And while it's never quite clear what 1,000 words the images might be saying to any one person, they're still really useful in communicating history and giving a sense of engagement with it. Using them well, using them well particularly these days where they can be reproduced so cheaply and easily requires care because of copyright. And we dealt with that in the subject as well, with that practical question of what can I use? How can I know whether something is available for use or not? Who can I contact to ask? We dabbled briefly with film and film not just as a historical source and again a historical source that we must be suspicious of, but also film as a means of communicating history. And here again, history, documentary is not the past. And with film, perhaps, we can most clearly pick up the way in which saying something interesting and useful about the past is history and not necessarily absolutely accurate documentation of the past itself. Throughout this subject, I've urged you to treat sources with suspicion, and I have introduced you to suspicious sources. It's hard not to be fooled, and some historical myths die hard. Sometimes we cling to ideas about the past that we want to believe. Sometimes people fool us because they're skillful. It seems awful to say it, but one of the things that I hope you've learnt in this subject is to be suspicious. To keep your wits about you. To trust no one. And to interpret evidence with care. But no matter how careful we are interpreting evidence, we're never going to pin the past to the page once and for all. History is constantly changing. And historical interpretations can change for very good reasons. And it is possible to legitimately hold quite different interpretations of the past at any one time in the present. And that brings us to the end of HI3284, except for the tutorial this week. I hope you've had fun in this subject. I love it. I've enjoyed engaging with you in tutorial. I hope this subject has given you an opportunity to reconsider how history gets written, 
both in terms of the people writing it and in terms of the sources that are available to write it with. And I hope you're looking forward to your own work making history going up online as part of Arcadia NQ. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this semester. <laughs>